Right, good afternoon, um, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. This is the seventh CLE talk organized by Rosli Dahlan uh, and Sarvana Partnership. <coughs> today, uh, my colleague uh, Ong Kun Sen and I will be touching on the topic of Bill of Leading. Uh, to those who have joined us today, uh, we presume you have heard of the Bill of Leading or of a Bill of Leading or well aware of this legal instrument. Um, or you could simply be someone who's interested in finding out more about it and its, its uses. Uh, the fact is, is that the Bill of Lading is in itself uh, fairly extensive and we only have, I believe, around an hour, 15 minutes to, to cover everything. So what Kunsen and I will be doing is we will first try and give you a basic overview um, of the Bill of Lading and then to look at the legal aspects of the Bill of Lading, in particular, the right of suit. So in the meantime, if you have um, any questions, please put it in the Q&A box at the bottom. And if time permits, we shall endeavor to answer as many questions as possible. So without um, further ado, can I please pass it on to Kunsen? Kunsen, please. Hi, uh, thanks, Kuhan. Uh, hi guys, my name is Kun Sen. Uh, so with me today is Ku uh, As introduced by Ku our topic today will be focused on Bill of Lading. Uh, uh, I will be doing the first part introducing what a Bill of Lading actually is and the legal principle around, so surrounding the Bill of Lading as well as uh, some legal issues surrounding the Bill of Lading. Uh, whereas Ku will be touching on the, the local law on Bill of Lading. Uh, before we start, uh, just a gentle reminder that today's uh, webinar is for discussion purpose. So all the material and all the picture illustration used are for, uh, are for discussion purposes. And if you have any legal issue, we strongly advise you to seek a uh, formal legal advice. And our discussion here in today shall not uh, constitute any legal advice. Okay, so let's start uh, our webinar today. Uh, can you help me to move the slides? Okay, so uh, what is a bill of lading? Uh, as introduced by Kuhun, I believe most of us are not uh, not really, uh, you know, we are we are not new to the word bill of lading. And uh, for those who are in the in the industry long enough, definitely you will know what is it and and what it encompasses. So. Uh, what bill of lading is, is actually a legal document. It, it actually looks like more like an invoice, but uh, slightly more, more comprehensive than the usual invoice that we see from day to day. Bec uh, simply because bill of lading is very, uh, uh, it's very special. We have an act in Malaysia governing specifically bill of lading. So that would set uh, bill of lading apart from the usual invoice we see from day to day. As you can see from the sample bill of lading uh, in my slides, you will be able to see certain uh, information. For example, uh, who are the shipper? Okay, sh shipper also, also connotes uh, the person who sell the goods or sometimes they use the word consignor. So the word is, in, uh, is, is interchangeably. Lah. So consignor means uh, the person that sells the goods and then the ship owner means uh, the owner of the ship or, or you also use the word carrier. Uh, then you will also see the information about the receiver, or we also say consignee. So consignee is the one that buys the goods or the one that receives the goods, like the, 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 the end, end person who receives the goods. So uh, like I say, uh, bill of lading is a slightly more comprehensive invoice. So you will find all this information on the bill of lading. Uh, you know, the, uh, the information about the consignor, the ship, uh, the consignee, what are the goods, uh, the quantity, some of it will set out the price, some of it will not, but you will find most of the information uh, on the view of lading itself. Uh, of course, you will, you, if, you, you, if you, you can see from the bottom of the view of lading, it was signed off by the ship owner. So uh, in short, in short, uh, Bill of Lading is a legal document. It's a legal document where you look at it, you will know uh, who, who, who are the seller, who are the buyer, and who are the, per who, who, what, 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 who are the, who are the carrier or who are the person that help you carry your goods from one destination to the other destination. So all these documents are, are, are found in the Bill of Lading. 
So generally, bill of lading is also a contract. Bill of lading is a legal document uh, issued by the ship owner to the consignor, which sets out the type, the quantity, and the destination of the goods. So this is what a bill of lading is. Uh, next slide. Okay, bill of lading, uh, uh, you, you, it may come to your surprise, uh, bill of lading usually in the practice or in the industry uh, issue in the set of three, meaning uh, an identical uh, copy of BOL is issued in three sets. So when the ship owner issue out the BOL, the ship owner definitely will, will, will retain the copy for, for himself or herself. And then one copy will be given to the consignor who are the seller. So for example, if I wanted to, if I wanted to sell certain goods to Kuhan uh, by ship, I would have to engage a, a ship who can help me to deliver the goods. So when I engage the ship, the ship, uh, the master of the ship or the, or the ship owner would issue a BOL to me saying that, look, this is, this is the BOL. Uh, you have engaged me to deliver uh, X amount of goods to Kuhan at this particular destination. Okay, so one copy will be retained by the ship owner and then one copy will be retained by myself or the consignor. And then what about the other copy? The other copy will also be given to me whereby I will email or I will deliver the, the, the third copy to the consignee. For example, in our case, which is Kuhan. So uh, the ship owner, myself and Kuhan, each of us would have a copy of the BOL. So this is how BOL are uh, usually uh, issued or, or, or operate uh, uh, in, 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 in the industry. Uh, next slide. Uh, uh, one more slide before that, before that. Yes, uh, yes, as I explained just now, so one copy will be, con will be retained by the, cons uh, by the ship owner one copy will be contained by myself, the consignor, and the last copy will be, will be, will be retained by the, by the consignee. So what happened is that if let's say Kuhan as the, as the, as the, as the buyer uh, who wanted to claim his good uh, at the port or at the dock, uh, he would have to present the, the bill of lading uh, to, the, to, the, to the ship owner that only, only upon the presentation of the bill of lading would the ship owner release the goods uh, to, to, to Kuhan or to the buyer. Okay, let's pause here for a moment. Uh, here we are talking about bill of lading issued in three copies. The contents of the bill of ladings are identical. Uh, the same information, the same uh, price, the same quantity, the same destination, and all of them, all the three copies are signed off by the ship owner, okay? Uh, you may, uh, one of the issues may arise is, or you may ask is, um, what about a situation where, say, Kuhan is the end user who are supposed to claim the good at the dock, but I, for some reason, um, you know, present, present the BOL uh, to the ship owner before Kuhan can do that. So would it mean that at the end of the day, whoever has the bill of lading can, can, you know, can claim the possession of the goods then what happens to the rest of the bill of lading? Uh, so this is the feature of a bill of lading, uh, which I will discuss in my, my next slides. Okay, like I say, bill of lading usually issue in three sets. Okay, so each of us will retain one, the ship owner gets one, I get one, and Fuhan get one. So how it operates in the real world is that, say for example, if Fuhan as the, as the buyer present the BOL to the ship owner, then the ship owner will take knowledge of, of his bill of lading and will release the goods to him. Then the question is, uh, what happened to the, to the rest of the bill of lading? What happened to the bill of lading that I have, I as a, as a seller have? So this is the principle that caused one of which being accomplished, the others to stand void. Uh, simply uh, to, put, to put it in the simple word means that whoever presents the first BOL to the ship owner, the ship owner will release the goods to him, the first, the first person who, who presents the BOL, and then the rest of the BOL uh, will, will, be, will be void, or rather we use the word stale. Stale BOL means um, it, has been, it has been void, you can't use it for any other purposes. 
uh, he you know because uh, goods has been delivered goods has been released to the to the to the other holder so even though you are still holding the rest of the bol it doesn't serve any legal purpose you can't even claim the goods so it's very important that uh, uh, to understand uh, the, the legal principles surrounding uh, the bill of lading and why bill of lading usually issue in a set of three. In this uh, very old uh, case of Glyn Mills, Curry and Co, uh, uh, decided by the House of Lords back in uh, 1881. So this is what the House of Lords said uh, to the phrase, uh, which I understand to mean that if Upon one of them, the ship owner acts in good faith, he would have accomplished his contract and will have fulfilled it and will not be liable or answerable upon any of the others. So uh, as simple as it sounds, so the principle is that uh, regardless, uh, irrespective of how many copies the BOLs were issued, so long as one of it being presented to the ship owner, uh, and the ship owner uh, 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 deliver the goods to the holder in good faith, then the, then the ship owner is not answerable to the other to the other to the other BOL holders. Okay. Uh, to give you a little bit more context, Bohen, um, can you move on to the next slides? Okay. So this is the brief facts of the case Glyn Nails Curry. What happened is very simple. It's a very simple uh, shipping case. In this case, there is a BOL. Uh, the BOL clearly stated that uh, you know, uh, we, are, we, are, we, we will be delivering a certain amounts of sugar to the consignee. So these are the destination, how many tons of sugar are to be delivered to the consignee. Uh, in this case, the consignee is not a party to it. Uh, reason being, uh, I'll explain it later. So the consignee, the end receiver, receiver is not a party to this case. What happened is that uh, uh, this consignee, he needs money. So what he, he has done is that he, he, he take his bill of lading, go to a bank, called Glyn, Merle's Curry and Co. is a bank. So he take the bill of lading to the bank and tell the bank, look, uh, I, I need money. Can you, can you advance me money? And as a security, I will give you my bill of lading as security. Okay. Uh, when the consignee do this, uh, the consignee did not tell uh, the ship owner at all. So the ship owner doesn't know uh, the consignee have actually, you know, uh, 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 used the BOL as a security uh, to the bank. So as far as the ship owner is concerned, the ship owner still thinks that based on the face of the BOL, the consignee is still the end receiver of the goods. Okay, that is what as far as the ship owner is concerned. As far as the bank is concerned, the bank uh, after, take, after taking the, the, the BOL and after releasing the money to the consignee, the bank also did not give notice to the ship owner. So uh, the bank thinks that since you, are giving, you have already given me a bill of lading and it's a security, I have released you the money, then, okay, when, when the ships are here, I can go and, and, and claim my goods. Lah. So that is what the bank had in mind. But what the bank did not do is that he did not inform the ship owner. He did not take any step to, to, you know, to protect his interest or to protect the title of, of his goods. So what happened in short, what happened in this case is that there was no communication when the consignee decided to, you know, to, to get money from the bank and decided to, to use the, the, the bill of lading as a security and the ship owner have no knowledge of such an assignment or, or of such an advance or, or of such security. So when the ship reached the port uh, 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 on the face of the, of the BOL, uh, the ship owner still thinks that the consignee is the end user, okay? So what happened after that is that the consignee, despite having gotten the money from the bank, despite giving the BOL to the bank as security, the consignee somehow still managed to produce a bill of lading to the ship owner, okay? Without, without telling the bank, of course, without telling the bank, he produced the BOL to the ship owner, the ship owner looked at the BOL, okay, look at it, you are the consignee, you are the, you are the consignee that, you know, stated on the BOL, I released the goods to you. So, uh, by accident or by mistake or, or for some reason, the ship owner released the goods to the consignee. So, one day later, 
the bank come to the dog and claims the goods. Okay, showing showing the shipment. Look, uh, I have this bill of lading. Uh, you know, uh, I'm the I'm I'm the holder of this bill of lading. Can you please give me my goods? Then the ship owner said, look, I already released it to the consignee, so it's not my problem anymore. Okay, so this is what happened. So the bank, of course, unhappy because he has already advanced the money to the consignee, and now the ship owner is telling him that, look, you are not getting your goods. Okay, so in this case, the bank sued the ship owner. Uh, what happened in the House of Lord is that uh, the House of Lord ultimately held that uh, the ship owner is not liable. Uh, for several reasons, and one of which being uh, what I've discussed earlier, uh, if one of the bill of lading being accomplished, the other stand to void, okay, or the others are becoming, be, have become stale. Up. The reason is being when the ship owner received the bill of lading from the consignee, um, he has no knowledge of the BOL being assigned to the bank at all. So the court held that uh, uh, if since the ship owner delivered the goods to the consignee in good faith based on the based on the BOL itself. So the ship owner is actually free from liability. Of course, situation and the outcome will be different if let's say the ship owner have knowledge uh, of the assignment and still deliver the goods to the consignee. Uh, in that case, then the ship owner will be held liable. But in such case, the court held that it would not be reasonable or it would be against the public policy to hold the ship owner liable when the ship owner have, have, have acted in good, faith, uh, in good faith, delivered the goods to the consignee without having any knowledge of the assignment. So in this case, the, the, the House of Work held that uh, the ship owner is not liable and the bank's uh, cost of action for conversion against the ship owner uh, was struck out or was dismissed. So from this, uh, Green Mouse and Curry is a very interesting case because it, 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 it discusses a lot of uh, legal principles surrounding the Bill of Lading. And one of the most prominent one is what I've just discussed. If one of the Bill of Lading is being accomplished, the other will stand to void. So uh, the key takeaway from this case is that if you have a lot of Bill of Lading, so you have a lot of copies of it, uh, you must be aware that uh, uh, whoever first claim the goods using the BOL, the rest of the BOL lading will, will, will not, be, not be held valid. Lah. So this is what uh, uh, the House of Lord held. Okay. Uh, moving on to the next slides. Okay. Yeah. So this is what the court has said. Uh, the one of those bills being accomplished, the other are to stand void. It would be neither reasonable or equitable, nor in accordance with the terms of such a contract, that an assignment of which the ship owner has no notice should prevent a bona fide delivery under one of the bill of learnings produced to him by the person named on the face of his entitled to delivery. So the key takeaway is this. You have three sets of bill of learning, Okay, I, as a ship owner, would only deliver the goods to whoever pr produced to me the first bill of Ladi. And if I do not have any knowledge uh, of the subsequent dealing, like I have no knowledge of you using uh, the bill of Ladi to get, to get a loan or you have assigned it or whatever, as so long as I act uh, in good faith, uh, I as a ship owner will be, will be, will be absorbed from, from liability. So this is the, this is the important principle uh, 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 you know, distilled in, in, in this house of case. Uh, next slides. Okay, so, so far we have discussed what is the Bureau of Lading and we have discussed uh, the, the interesting case that talks about the, the principle of what accomplished the other stand to steal. Okay, so now we go into what, what purpose does a BOL serves? Okay, firstly, of course, uh, as, as I've said, the bill of lading is evidence of contract of shipment. Like I said, if I am the seller and Kuhan is a buyer, okay, I wanted to ship my goods to Kuhan. I have to find a ship to do that. So when, so when I engage a ship to do that, the ship would give me a BOL and that BOL would be the contract between myself and the ship owner. 
Okay, so that would give me a right to sue the ship owner or give the ship owner the right to, to defend the action. So, so again, the House of Lords in the case of Glyn, Mills and Curry says that um, the primary office on the purpose of a bill of body, although by mercantile law and usage is a symbol of the right of property in the goods, is to express the terms of the contract between the shipper, which is the consigner, and the ship owner. Okay, so this is the this is one of the purpose of a BOL. Uh, next. Um, second, the document of title to goods or cargo. Okay, like I said, if Kuhan is an end user, I have given him a BOL. Then upon the presentation of the BOL to the ship owner, uh, Kuhan can get the goods uh, from the ship owner. So this is what the House of Law has said. Uh, the view of loadings would be the title bits. Okay, so further down, this is what the House of Lords said. In any of those cases, all that the master of the ship would have to say is this, where is your title deed? Produce your title deed. So say for example, if Kuhan for some reason cannot produce the BOL to the ship owner, the ship owner will not deliver the goods to him. Okay, so further down, this is what the House of Lords further said. And if there was no fraud and no notice of any different title brought home to the master, all that the master would have to do would be to deliver to the person having that title deed, and then he will be free from any responsibility. So, uh, BR is a very important document for me as a seller, but it is also a very important document for Kuhan as the, as the, as the, as the, as the buyer, as a receiver. So, in order for him to claim the goods or the title of the goods, uh, he can use the BOL and to present the BOL to the ship owner. Uh, okay, uh, for further information, uh, if a ship owner, so, uh, sorry, yeah. Um, Gwen, can you back to the previous slide? Just a small, small note. Ah, a ship owner is not free from liability if goods were delivered to the wrong person without the production of the BOL. So, a uh, ship owner is not allowed to release the goods if the person come forward did not actually, you know, present the BOL to him. It is uh, then, then then the ship if the ship owner still release the goods to the person without that person showing his BOL, then the ship owner will be held liable. Uh, okay, uh, next slide. Okay, um, the, the third implication of the BOL is that since the BOL itself indicated the quantity and the destination and you know uh, the type of goods being shipped on the BOL, the BOL is also signed off by the, by the ship owner. So the BOL itself is the proof, is, is the admission or proof that goods actually were on board goods were actually being shipped on board. So the ship owner cannot turn around and argue that, look, um, you have only shipped uh, 20 tons on, on, on my ship, not 60 tons as, as, as stated in the Bill of Lading. So what's important is that uh, whatever stated on the Bill of Lading uh, is presumed to be true unless uh, um, the party, the party, the party uh, disputing it can, 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 can show some document to show otherwise. So, so the, take, the key takeaway is that whatever stated in the Bill of Lading is stated to be true and the ship owner must be careful when, when, when he signed off the Bill of Lading because one is signed off, uh, whatever stated of it is presumed to be true. Okay, so these are the three, three main uh, features of the Bill of Lading. To recap, firstly, uh, Bill of Lading is a contract between the seller and the ship owner. It sets out the term, it sets out the quantity, the type of goods and the destination to be shipped, okay? Secondly, the bill of lading is also a title. So, uh, Kuhan will be able to claim his, his, his good at the port with the bill of lading in his hand and all, he, all, all that he needs to do is just to present it to the ship owner and then the ship owner will release the goods to him and then the rest of the bill of lading uh, will become void. And thirdly, uh, whatever stated on the view of lading is presumed to be true uh, unless it is uh, proof otherwise. So, so these are these are these are the importance of a BOL and the implication of a BOL 
And these are what sets a normal invoice apart uh, from a DOL. Uh, next slide. Okay, before I, I finish or end my part of the talk, uh, there are many types of BOL in the, in the market or in the industry, but, uh, but the main one will be a straight BOL and the to order BOL, okay? What means by a straight BOL uh, doesn't mean that the paper itself is straight. It doesn't mean that way. What means by straight is that uh, uh, in the BOL, in the consignee column, uh, you will see the name of the consignee only. Say for example, I wanted to ship the goods to Kuhun. In the consignee box, I will only put Kuhun's name and that's it. So in this kind of BOL, it's not transferable or non-negotiable because uh, simply because um, I only intend for this good to be shipped to Kuhan and no one else. So Kuhan cannot use uh, the straight BOL to, you know, and assign it to someone else or use as security to, to borrow money from the bank. A commercial bank will look at a BOL, a, a straight BOL would tell Kuhan, look, it's a straight BOL, I can take this. Okay, so this is what a straight BOL is. And uh, even though, uh, even though it is non-transferable, even though Kuhan is the only consignee, Kuhan still need to present the BOL to the, the ship owner in order to claim his title. Okay, so this is what was held in the case of McWilliam against Mediterranean ship, Shipping Corps as a, uh, 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 it was a case held by the House of Lord, which says that even though the, the name consignee is the actual receiver of the goods, is the actual person who has the title of the goods, he still need to present the BOL to the ship owner in order for him to, to, to obtain the goods. So this is something for, 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 for you to, to, to take note. Okay, uh, as opposed to a straight BOL, to order BOL is slightly different. To order BOL in the consignment box, you will say, you, you will, you will say something, for example, um, to the order of Kuhan, or to the order of myself, or to the assign of someone else. Uh, what it means is that uh, uh, the, the, the person who received the goods at the end of the day doesn't necessarily have to be Kuhan. Okay, to, it can be to the order of Kuhan. Kuhan can, for example, um, um, ask the agent to, 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 to take the goods on his behalf. So hence the word to order of Kuhan or Kuhan can even assign it to, to the bank or, you know, or mortgage it to the bank, then of course the bank would come and claim the goods. So uh, a to order BOL is uh, negotiable, is, is, is transferable in the sense that the legal title of the goods is, 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 is free to move. So it gives a bit more flexibility uh, 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 in, in the BOL. So what happened in the case of uh, Glyn uh, Mill's career is the to order BOL. That is where the consignee assigned the, the, the BOL to the bank. But uh, of course, uh, what happened was that the bank did not inform uh, the ship owner. The ship owner also didn't, didn't, didn't aware of it. So, so that is what, what, what happened in, in, in that case. Uh, okay, so far what I've covered is that uh, what is a BOL and the legal implication of a BOL and the principle that one being accomplished, uh, the other will stand forth. And BOL is an important document for three reasons. First, BOL is, uh, is the title deed for the, for the, for the buyer. Uh, BOL is also a contract between the seller and the shipper. And thirdly, BOL is important because uh, the shipper cannot, or, or sorry, the ship owner cannot later turn around and say, look, uh, you have only you have only shipped twenty tons on my ship and not fifty tons. So the, the BOL itself is 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 evidence that a uh, certain amount of goods has been shipped uh, or has been loaded on the boat. So these are the things uh, uh, um, a person need to be aware of when he has the bill of lading in his hands. Okay, so that would be my part on the bill of lading. I would now pass to Kuhan, where Kuhan will uh, address to you uh, the law, the, the local law governing the BOL. Kuhan, back to you. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Gunsen. 
so yeah, so I will be touching on the laws governing the bill of lading in Malaysia. Uh, in particular, as we progress, I will focus on the right of suit and how it's applied here in Malaysia versus in, in UK and Singapore. So generally speaking, the law governing the bill of lading in Malaysia is to an extent you have the carriage of goods by sea amendment act. Now this is not the carriage of goods by sea that I'll be referring to later. This is the different carriage of goods by sea. And the second one is the bill of lading act 1855 or BOLA. This would be the primary legislation that we focus on for the you know, next few minutes. So before I go into uh, the, the crux of it, let me first build on what Kunsen has already stated. Now, the use of bill of lading can be traced back to as far back as the 14th century. Now, in its very primitive primal form, it was nothing but a receipt to indicate the nature as well as the cargo and the quantity. But <clears throat> mercantile practice uh, changed and due to the mercantile practice, they saw the incorporation of terms of carriages in the bill of lading and its elevation to a document of title such that uh, when you possess the bill of lading, it is deemed constructive possession of the goods. Now, recognition uh, of bill of lading as a symbol for the goods then allowed for the sale of goods to a third party. So goods were delivered and by endorsement and transfer bill of lading whilst they were in shipment. So you can see evidence of this in the 1883 case uh, of Sanders and McKellen, where even back then they were already you know, doing it this way. Uh, <clears throat> now, however, although this seemingly nonchalant transfer bill of lading third party, it did not operate to transfer the rights under the bill of lading to a third party due to the doctrine of privity of contract. So in order to overcome this and to effect automatic contractual rights to the endorsee, the bill of lading act or BOLA of 1855 was enacted in the UK. So how then did this UK legislation end up here in Malaysia? Well, BOLA is applicable in Malaysia by virtue of section 5.1 of the Civil Law Act 1956, and Section 51 says as follows, in all questions which arise or which have to be decided in the state of Peninsula of Malaysia or other than Malacca and Penang, with respect to the law of partnership, corporations, banks and banking, principals and agents, carriers by air, land and sea, marine insurance, average, life and fire insurance, and with respect to mercantile law generally, the law to be administered shall be the same as would be administered in England in the like case at the date of coming into force of this act. So, of course, as you're well aware, 1956 was prior to independence and we, some of the laws that we most likely never had our own piece of legislation, so we used the UK law. And the Bill of Lading Act is one of those laws that are still in force now. Now, but the irony of it is that UK itself no longer applies BOLA and has repealed it and replaced it with the Carriage of Goods by Sea Act 1992, the UK COXA. This is not to be confused with the earlier COXA. Now, because, and the reason why they did this is because there were many problems associated with the Bill of Lading Act itself, with the BOLA, one of which was poor drafting. And the, the use of bill of lading uh, has become so varied that the act, which was uh, made in 1855, was no longer capable of comprehending or providing the level of security needed uh, that it was intended to produce back when it was first enacted. And thirdly, it was also the issue of passing a property. Uh, we will explain that later as I go on. But in Malaysia, as you're well aware, Section 19 of the Sales of Goods Act, I believe, is the one that governs passing of property. In the UK was Section 17. And so it did not sit very well with the Act. Now, COXA 
which was, like I told, like I mentioned before, was adopted in 1992, has also been adopted in many other Commonwealth jurisdictions, including Singapore. So in essence, when it comes to Singapore, you have Malaysia practicing the primitive form of the Bill on Aiding Act, uh, the one that will appeal, and then you have Singapore, who's practicing the more modern uh, Bill of Aiding Act, as it is practiced in the UK. So can we move to the next slide, please? Next one. All right. <clears throat> so before I go into the crux of, of, um, of, the, of the talk today, uh, let me first address the, 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 the problem child in the room, which is section one. And section one states as follows, right? Every consignee of goods named in a bill of lading and every endorsee of a bill of lading to whom property in the goods therein mentioned shall pass upon or by reason of such consignment or endorsement shall have transferred to and vested in him all rights of suit and be subject to the same liabilities in respect of such goods as if the contract contained in the bill of lading has been made by himself, with himself. Now from the wording, it is evident that the right of suit is only vested in him or her when the property in the goods has passed to him or her by reason of consignment or endorsement. Therefore, in order to benefit from the right of suit, in order to benefit from section one um, and to sue a carrier in contract, there must be two requirements that must be established. Firstly, he or she is the consignee named on the bill of lading or endorsee of the bill of lading. And the second one is the property in the goods must have passed to him or her upon or by reason of such, such consignment or endorsement. So when these two elements are present, only then does the right of suit vest in a particular person. Now, the issue with this is that it, it does not fit a modern concept of international trade where passing of property, as we have seen earlier, and as Kunsan himself has explained before, occurs independently of the transfer bill of lading, right? as, and is often passed by a contract sale, <coughs> or a contract of sale. Now, the passing of property is contemplated usually between the buyer and the seller, and the bill of lading is usually received long after the cargo has been discharged from the vessel. And property, passes independently of consignment or endorsement of the bill of lading. In other words, the property passes from one party uh, to another when they intend it per the contract of sale. And the bill of lading is hardly factored in into that, that, uh, that contemplation. And because of that, it creates a problem, right? And we will see what this problem, this, this problem is in um, the case in our next case called the Delphini. Now in this sense, and the Delphini is very important because it was uh, kind of prophetic in, in many ways because, and I'll show you why. Although the event happened in 1985, it was symbolic of how international trade is, is usually working. And you got to keep in mind that the Delphini happened in, 19, in 1985 and 1980s was, it's toward 1970s, toward the, towards the 80s, the, the economy wasn't doing that well. And a lot of people suffered because of this and because of you know, passing a bill of lading to, to the banks and security and et cetera. So it created a lot of problems. And we will see that even in the Delphini, the court themselves acknowledged this problem. Can we go to the next slide, please? <clears throat> So, <clears throat> so let me start first with the uh, facts surrounding uh, the, 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 the case of the Delphini. Now, the case of Delphini involves a company called Sona Trash, who sold 100,000 tons of Algerian condensate on FOB terms to Vano. Now, of that 100,000 tons, uh, Vano then sold 20 to 25,000 tons to Anycam, to a CIF Gela in Italy, who in turn uh, sold it to their, one of their associates called Anycam ANC SPA 
on the 29th of July, 1985. Now, Vanot's contract with Anycap was payment was to be made either against the shipping documents, which was in a bill of lading, or a letter of indemnity in the event that the bill of lading was not available at the time of payment. Anycap was also required to provide a bank guarantee no later than the date of nomination of the vessel. On uh, 30th of July, uh, Vanol entered a voyage charter party with the defendant ship owner, under which Vanol was allowed to instruct uh, the defendant to discharge the cargo against Vanol's letter of indemnity. So if the bill of lading was not available uh, at the time of discharge. And so on the 2nd of August, the vessel was loaded in Algeria and a bill of lading was issued, naming Sona Trash as a shipper. Now, on the 4th of August, the vessel arrived in Gela and gave notice of readiness, but did not berth until the 7th of August. Right? These dates are very important. When the vessels arrived in Banol, it did not have the bill of lading, which was still with the Algerian shipper, Sonatash. Now, lacking the bill of lading, and without this bill of lading, on the 5th of August, Banol issued two telex letters of indemnity. One to the ship with instructions to deliver to any camp without production of the bill of lading, and one to any camp with an invoice who were paying for the goods without having all the documents. Now the ship discharged the goods between the 7th and the 9th of August. On the 12th of August, any camp paid Vanol against the letter of indemnity. On the 20th of August, Vanol Bank received the original bill of lading endorsed in blank by the shipper, which were in turn forwarded to Anycam, and thus cancelling the letter of indemnity. Anycam then sued the ship owner in respect of short delivery under Section 1 of the Bill of Lading Act 1855. <coughs> now, the court found that Section 1 of BOLA did not apply as the property in the good, goods did not pass to Anycam by reason of endorsement of the Bill of Lading. Although the Court of Appeal held that the endorsement of the Bill of Lading need not be simultaneous with the passing of property, it did, not, uh, it did hold that the endorsement of the Bill of Lading must play an essential causal role in the passing of the property. So this goes back to the earlier two elements that is required under Section 1. Now, the, this decision was clearly, uh, I mean, clearly did not provide a um, satisfactory outcome. And... Uh, and it was felt that go to the next slide again. And it was felt that the, the real remedy was actually to amend this act. And this was stated by Lord Mustill in, in the Delphini as well. If you look at the highlighted part, that there, there was something uh, seriously wrong with the act, and it was just no longer doing what it was supposed to do. And it was creating more harm than good, I suppose, to, to a certain extent. And the law commission by this time in 1985 was already uh, reviewing the uh, law. Can we go to the next slide? So as a result of the review by the Law Commission, uh, we have the COXA. And in place of section one of BOLA, we have section 2.1 and then uh, section 2.2 of COXA. And the wordings used in COXA unlike BOLA, separates the contractual rights from the passing of property. So this legislation enables the lawful holder of the bill of lading to sue the carrier in contract, irrespective of the question of passage of property or by reason uh, of consignment or endorsement. Therefore, what this means is, therefore, any lawful holder of the bill of lading acquires the right to sue regardless of properties in the goods have passed under section 21 of the act. Now, section 22 on the uh, on a side note, uh, COXA actually did go a step further in the sense that uh, attachment of rights of suit to a bill of lading can only be acquired after delivery. Uh, now, this creates a possibility uh, of improper trading in the bill of lading, situations where the bill of lading can be negotiated uh, for cash in the open market purely as causes of action against a subsequent delivery uh, of the carrier, and this has happened. To prevent this, uh, Section 22A was enacted, and 
it effectively prevents the transfer of the right to a holder unless that party has become a holder of the bill by virtue of a transaction effected in pursuance of any contractual relationship or any other arrangement uh, made before the time when such a right to possession cease to attach to the possession of the bill uh, of lading. So, <clears throat> uh, next slide, please. So, um, a very, I suppose, um, a good example of this is uh, in this very recent case of the UU902. Um, in this case, <coughs> the bill of lading was used as a document of security. And let me walk you through the uh, facts. The facts here are very similar to the Delphini in the sense that uh, the only difference is the end holder was the bank. Uh, on the 11th of March, 2016, FGV, the seller of cargo of 10,000 metric tons of refined, bleached and deodorized palm oil, the, which we'll call the cargo, had entered a charter party with the defendant ship owner for the charter of the vessel, the UU902. Now the cargo, was then sold to Avanti, who then sold it on to Ruchi, and the final receiver, uh, who was the final receiver, following contract signed between both parties on the 4th of April, 2016. On the 12th of April, 2016, the defendant received instructions for the cargo to be transported to New Mangalore, India. Now, upon, upon um, loading the cargo, 14 bill of ladings were issued, on behalf of the defendant of the cargo, for the cargo. Now on the 19th of April, 2016, the bill of lading was released to FGV following payment of freight to the defendant. Now on the 22nd of April, 2016, FGV issued a letter of, uh, issued a letter of indemnity to the defendant for the delivery of cargo to Ruchi without the production of bill of lading. This was, as I stated earlier, quite similar to what happened in the Delphi. Likewise, on the same day, Avanti issued a back-to-back -back letter of indemnity to FGV, requesting that FGV to deliver the cargo to Ruchi without the bill of lading. Now at this stage, right, there's just like a, a whole chain of back-to-back -back bill of a letter of indemnities from Ruchi going to the subseller Avanti and then going to FGV and lastly to the defendant uh, vessel, all saying deliver it without the bill of lading. On the 24th of April 2016, the UU arrived in New Mangalore and began to discharge the cargo on the 27th of April 2016. Now, at this point, the plaintiff comes in. Now, OCBC received the 14 bill of lading from FGV through Maybank on the 26th of April, 2021, say 2016. The plaintiff then uh, proceeded to inform Avanti of the arrival of the document and requested payment instructions. Avanti replied by requesting financing from the plaintiff for the entire purchase price, which was about uh, US 7,400 something by way of a trust receipt loan. In return, they pledged the bill of lading as security However, when it came time to pay, Avanti couldn't because they became insolvent. Next slide. They became insolvent and eventually defaulted on the, on the trust receipt. And OCBC was left with no other choice but to proceed um, on the 14th of June to enforce its security over the bill of leading by demanding delivery uh, of the cargo from the defendant. Now, in this case, the owners argued that, amongst other things, that OCBC had not acquired the right of suit under Section 2 of the Singapore Bill of Lading Act, which is perimetrial to the UK's folks, because OCBC only became the holder of the Bill of Lading after delivery of the cargo to Uchi. Now, the court did not accept this uh, argument on the basis that delivery of cargo pursuant to a letter of indemn indemnity did not render a bill of lading as being spent or, or null, as the letter of indemnity did not relieve the owner from its paramount uh, obligation under the presentation rule. 
Now, even if the bill of lading had been spent, uh, OCBC was entitled to rely on the exceptions under Section 22 of the BLA by virtue of it coming into possession of the bill of lading pursuant to the facilities agreement between OCBC uh, and Avanti. Now, if you remember, Section 2, 1, sub 2, sub 2, A earlier said uh, exactly that. Section 2, sub 2, above required that it stated that, uh, can I go up to the two, two please? Two, two. Uh, no. okay, no. So it says that unless the party has become a holder of a bill of lading by virtue of a transaction affected in pursuance of any contractual relationship or any other arrangement made before the time when such a right of possession ceased to attach to the possession of the bill. So that it was on that basis that the um, court made that finding and it made a finding in favor of uh, OCBC. Now, had the same case happened in Malaysia, the outcome would be uh, most likely be very different. The next slide. The outcome would be very different, and you know we would never know what would happen. But uh, for the time being, thankfully, we don't have to uh, face it yet. So that is the um, end of my presentation. Uh, is concern? You still around? Yeah. Uh, yeah, okay. I'm still around. So we will move to the Q and A. Uh, to those of you who have questions, you can put it in the Q and A box. So concern. Uh, let me see. We have six questions. I'll start with the first one. If A has advanced money to the consignee or buyer upon the bill of lading, what can A do to protect his interest or title of the goods since there are other parts of the bill of lading? Uh, okay. Um, I think this is what uh, happened in in we, we I mean we can learn the lesson from what have happened in the case of uh, of uh, Glean and Mills courageous now. So uh, in that case, uh, the house of law actually how that um, as the bank, there are several ways where where you as a bank can protect your interest. Okay, uh, there are three ways. Uh, first of course is being that uh, you alter the practice to such an extent that only one BOL is issued, okay? If that is only one BOL, then your interest is protected like, because uh, if the BOL is in your hand, then it's in your hand. So there's no other counterparts of the BOL. But of course, if already issued in three sets and then nothing you can do about changing the practice, then maybe what you can do is, as a bank, you probably would want to, you probably want to brought in all the other counterparts of the BOL. Okay, so if there are three parts and, and say, for example, uh, I lend you money, Kuhn, and you know, you have a BOL, I have a BOL. So in order to protect your interest, you definitely want me to surrender my BOL to you so that you know there are three copies, you already have two, then the other one is with the ship owner. So when you present a BOL, I can't do, I, I mean, I can't go and present another BOL because I don't have it anymore. So I think that is one way of protecting if you are, you are, you are, you, if let's say you are lending me money based on the BOL, I think that's one of it. And the other one is that if you didn't do that, I still have a copy of the BOL and you still have a copy. I think what you have to do is that you may have to go to the, to the port uh, early than anyone do or anyone does. So when the ship are there, the goods are here, you immediately claim the possession. I think that is the best case scenario. If you, if you are, if, if let's say you, you advance the money to me and you don't want anything to happen, I think that is a precaution step you may want to do. I mean, if to be safe, you can ask me to give you my BOL, you collect everyone's BOL and you still be there early. I think in that case, if you have lent me money then I think that is the best case scenario. I think that is what's also discussed in the House of Lord and the House of Lord actually suggested those, those uh, mechanism if, 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 a similar situation arises. I hope you answer Thank the you. questions. Yeah. Thank you, Vincent. Uh, let me see. Uh, so far, is there any legal cases in regards to the bill of lading in Malaysia? Yep, there's a lot. Uh, go on, Lexis, you'll find it. Type bill of lading, you'll find it. 
<laughs> so, uh, <laughs> uh, if there are two competing claims against the title of the cargo, right? If there are two competing claims against the title of the cargo, what can a ship owner do to avoid cargo being delivered to the wrong party? Um, well, interesting, interesting. Um, say, for example, that um, again, um, you, you and I, I'm the, I'm, uh, I'm the consignee and I assign my BOL to you. You are the bank and you have a copy of the BOL. I have a copy of the BOL and we go to the port the same day to claim the goods. And the ship owner would like, okay, so who should I give it to? Okay, uh, unless the ship owners uh, with certainty can determine who are the real owner, then he can release the good to the owner that he thinks is the real owner. Of course, at, at its own cost, like, because you don't know whether you are delivering to the good or the right or wrong person. I think the, I think the safer way to do that is to go to the court and let the court decide. Okay, we have a mechanism called interpleader. Whereby, the, whereby if there are two competing claims, claiming the title and you're not sure which one to give, then it is best to let, to, to let the court decide uh, among two of them who has the better title, you know, rather than you determine who you think is the, is the, is the owner. If, I mean, if you guess it correctly, you guess it correctly. If you guess it wrongly, then you are, you, you are getting yourself into trouble. So I think um, it will be more prudent if you are a ship owner and you face in this kind of situation, uh, a mechanism called interpleader uh, would be the most uh, safer situation. Let the court decide who has the better claims. So I mm. think that that is the idea, uh, the, uh, the way to go. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Vincent. Um, <clears throat> let me see if we have any other questions. Uh, uh, why has Malaysia not adopted the UK COXA or something better? And how has it affected trade in Malaysia? Uh, well, Okay, I'll, I'll try and answer that. Um, you can answer that. <laughs> why have we not accepted uh, the UK COXA? Well, we don't know. Um, honestly, we, we, I'm not very sure as to why we have not accepted it. The problems that are often associated with it are, are fairly, I mean, the problem associated with the bill of lading is fairly well known. Uh, and therefore, it, it does not provide the kind of security uh, that that we would require, or that is, in fact, very uh, paramount in international trade. So, why will the uh, no one? Um, why will that? There's no change. I absolutely have no idea. But in terms of the effects that it has on international trade, I think it's what it simply means is that there won't be many people who would use the Malaysian jurisdiction. They would much rather. The Singapore jurisdiction uh, and have the laws governed by Singapore law. And as a result, more often than not, I presume then if it ends up in litigation, it will also end up in Singapore. Um, in fact, if Malaysia had accepted the UK uh, Bill of Meeting, uh, uh, the COXA, UK COXA Act, then, you know, for all we know, the uh, more and more legislation would come our way uh, because there would be. Uh, based on Malaysian law. So, for example, in the case of the UU, the OCBC Bank, May Bank, were all Malaysian banks that uh, had their legislation, that had their contract governed by uh, Singapore, and it was finally decided in the courts of Singapore. So, to me, I think that's the only, that's one of the, not the only, but one of the bad, uh, one of the negatives of sticking with the Bill of Lading. The second Bill of Lading Act, the second issue is, of course, the security, it does not guarantee security. But that, I think that issue has been uh, well uh, had already. So let me see if there is. Uh, yes, so would the position of Glynn, Mills, Curry and Co be different in the, if the Bill of Lading does not contain the provision that one of which being accomplished the other to stand void does not contain the provision? Oh, okay, I think maybe I can answer that. Uh, okay, like I've said before, if you have that provision in your BOL, uh, I think of, things will be more, 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 more simple, uh, simply because um, so long as one of them is being accomplished, the other will stand void. Uh, yes, the question then becomes, if what if your BOL did not specify that? Uh, well, 
I would say the position would still be the same. Uh, in fact, the uh, House of Law actually discussed uh, the situation, what if uh, the provision was not inserted? So what the court, what the House of Law had held is that uh, uh, the, the outcome would still be the same, uh, simply because if I engage a ship owner for delivery, although the contract or the BOL did not provide for that particular clause, um, the ship owner would still be able to discharge his duty under the contract uh, if he has acted in good faith. So meaning, if let's say uh, the contract is for me to deliver the goods to you, to Kuhan, and at the end of the day, the ship owner did deliver the goods to you, Kuhan, uh, despite although you have already you know, um, assigned to someone else, uh, the ship owner is still released from obligation because based on the contract, his contractual obligation is to deliver the goods to you, as simple as that. Unless, of course, uh, he has knowledge of you know, the, 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 the subsequent dealings. But if he has no such knowledge, uh, I don't think the case or the outcome will be any difference. It will still be the same. Okay, thank you, Kunzen. Let's see. No problem. Uh, okay, can a lawful holder of uh, can a lawful holder of a bill of lading lawful holder of bring who has suffered no loss bring an action against a ship owner to recover another person's loss can a lawful holder okay okay i think i get it more, more or less um well yes uh i can try answering this actually actually they you can more or less because section two sub four does enable a lawful holder of a bill of lading uh, pursuant to section 2 sub 2a to bring an action against a ship owner although he has suffered no loss. Uh, I think there's a case uh, that says this, uh, uh, Pace Shipping, I believe, that says this, that the court stated that the defendant, I believe it was in that case, was entitled to pursuant to his own course of action or by having suffered no loss to recover and in due course account for all the uh, the monies that I presume it was owned by someone else. So to answer your question, yes, uh, off the top of my head, yes, you can under Section 2.4. Uh, the case, I believe it's called pay shipping and uh, that lays out how and, and how you go about uh, doing it. Uh, so we'll take one more question. Uh, what is a house bill of lading? Oh, okay, concern you and try. House bill of lading. Um, I have not come across that house bill of lading. Uh, uh, yeah, maybe I can. Maybe you can chip in. Uh, house bill of lading is basically a, a document created by a freight forwarder or a non vessel operating company. Uh, so, in other words, this, this, uh, they, they don't have a vessel. Again, keep in mind a bit of lading is between uh, the, the consignee and the shipper, isn't it? Correct. So, but this one, they do not have a vessel and the document is uh, an acknowledgement of the receipt of goods that are to be shipped. Uh, it is issued to uh, the supplier or the shipper once the cargo has been received and the consignee who the freight forwarder delivers the shipment to. So in a small nutshell, that is what a um, house bill of lading is. Like. It's quite similar but it's created by a freight forwarder or a non-vessel operating company. That is primarily the difference. Uh, so I okay. suppose that is all the questions we have. Uh, thanks, Kuhan, for, for, for organizing this. And, uh, and it was a lovely discussion. Yep. Uh, so thank you, Kunsun, for, for no problem. coming on board. No problem. Uh, and uh, that's all the time we have. So that's all the questions we have as well. So uh, please join us on 10th December, 2021 for a final CLE talk entitled Wills, Probate and Administration of Estates in Malaysia. Uh, that will be delivered by our colleague, uh, Ms. Jenny, as well as Ms. Stephanie. So we will see you on the 10th of December, 2021. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, thanks for attending. Thanks. Thanks, Vincent. Thanks, Vincent. Thanks, Vincent.